But do your best to do this every day. If you miss a day, no big deal, but try not to miss more than one day. Otherwise, your mental and physical health will start to suffer. The first thing I do after I wake up is I take the pen that's on my nightstand and the pad of paper on my nightstand and I write down the time in which I woke up. Now, I do sleep with my phone in my room. I realize this is considered a sin and has certain hazards associated with it. But I put my phone on airplane mode about an hour before I go to sleep. And then I set my alarm typically for 6.30 a.m. And some days the alarm wakes me up. Other days I wake up before the alarm. And yes, some days the alarm goes off and I hit snooze a few times. And then usually by 7 a.m. I am up and out of bed. The reason for writing down what time I wake up is because I want to know that average wake up time. That average wake up time informs what's called my temperature minimum. It tells me when my body temperature was lowest. The temperature minimum is the time in each 24 hour cycle that your body temperature is lowest. I don't sleep with a thermometer in my mouth or elsewhere, and I don't think you should either. Instead, I know that the lowest temperature that my body will be at across the 24 hour cycle tends to be two hours before my typical wake up time. And I want to know that number. It's called our temperature minimum. So if you're somebody that typically wakes up at 8 a.m., then your temperature minimum is sometime around 6 a.m. Remember, the temperature minimum is a time in the 24 hour cycle. I don't care what my actual temperature is. I care when my lowest temperature is. And I know that that lowest temperature is approximately two hours before my average wake up time. So I highly recommend that you write down when you wake up or track that in some way that works for you and use that as a reference point to determine your temperature minimum. We will return to the temperature minimum and how you can leverage the temperature minimum for several things, shifting your clock, shifting your circadian sleep schedule and wake schedule, also for shifting your eating schedule, etc. We will return to that, but even if you don't travel, even if you don't care about things like jet lag, even if you sleep fabulously all year round, never have a poor night's sleep, knowing your temperature minimum, that time when your temperature is at its lowest point, is a valuable thing to know. The second thing I do after I wake up is to get into forward ambulation, which is just nerd speak for taking a walk. I have a dog, and as many of you know, he's a bulldog, and he doesn't really like to walk, especially not in the morning. But for humans and for animals, there's a phenomenon whereby when we generate our own forward motion, forward ambulation, visual images pass by us on our eyes, so-called optic flow. And for those of you that are low vision or no vision, the same phenomenon occurs in the auditory system. Sounds pass by us in so-called auditory flow. Getting into a mode of forward ambulation and especially experiencing visual flow has a powerful effect on the nervous system. The effect it has is essentially to quiet or reduce the amount of neural activity in this brain structure called the amygdala. Amygdala means almond, and many of you have probably heard about the amygdala for its role in anxiety and fear and threat detection. And indeed, the amygdala is part of the network in the brain that generates feelings of fear and threat and anxiety. It does a bunch of other things too, but that's one of its primary functions. There are now at least half a dozen quality papers published in quality peer-reviewed journals that show that Forward ambulation, walking or biking or running, and generating optic flow in particular, has this incredible property of lowering activity in the amygdala and thereby reducing levels of anxiety. There are two papers that I'd like to highlight in particular that relate to this phenomenon. The first one was published in the journal Neuron, and the title of this paper is Whole Brain Functional Ultrasound Imaging. That just means they have a cool technique to evaluate the activity of structures in the brain across the entire brain reveals brain modules for visual motor integration. What they found in this study, and I should mention the first author is Masse. This comes from Botan Roska's group. This was work done in mice, but I'll talk about other species in a moment. What they found was essentially that when these mice walk forward 
and their eyes move from side to side, which is a natural consequence of moving forward. So-called optic flow is flowing past their eyes. Many brain areas are activated, increase in their level of firing, but the amygdala in particular reduced its levels of firing. That's a very interesting finding, but it is in mice. However, another paper, Eye Movement Intervention Enhances Extinction via Amygdala Deactivation, was published in the, the Journal of Neuroscience, a strong journal, and shows that, again, these eye movements, these lateral eye movements from side to side, reduce activity levels in this fear slash threat slash anxiety center in the brain, the amygdala. Now, those are eye movements. They didn't specifically look at forward ambulation. And yet other papers have looked at forward ambulation. And we know that forward ambulation, walking forward, generates the sorts of eye movements that cause optic flow and reductions in amygdala activation. So for me, this process of taking a walk each morning isn't about exercise. It's not about burning calories. It's not about any of that. It's really about getting into optic flow and reducing the levels of amygdala activation. Now, I don't have anxiety. At least I don't have chronic anxiety or generalized anxiety. I tend to have a lot of energy, but at these points in the morning, I'm not very energetic. Sometimes I'm sort of shuffling more than I'm walking. In fact, and Costello is almost always shuffling and I'm almost always trying to drag him first thing in the morning. But that walk is a particularly important protocol each day because it really serves to push my neurology in the direction that I'd like it to go, which is alert, but not anxious. So the forward ambulation and this optic flow is the way that I ensure based on quality peer reviewed data that my amygdala activation is slightly suppressed. Now, at the same time, I also want the alertness. I want alert and focused. I don't just want to be sleepy or super, super relaxed. I want to have a high degree of focus and alertness because I'm soon going to move into a bout of work. I need to lean into the day. So in order to do that, I make sure that the walking is done outdoors. That might be sort of a duh, but many people get up and start moving around their house, their apartment, and they don't go anywhere. And just walking around inside, it will generate some optic flow, but nothing like the sort of optic flow that you can generate in larger environments, like out of doors environments. If you can't get outdoors, doing it indoors is perfectly fine but it's not going to have the same magnitude of positive effect. Now, in order to get the alertness, I do it outdoors because I also want sunlight in my eyes. I know many of you have heard me talk about this ad nauseum on various podcasts and this podcast, but getting sunlight in your eyes first thing in the morning is absolutely vital to mental and physical health. It is perhaps the most important thing that any and all of us can and should do in order to promote metabolic well-being promote the positive functioning of your hormone system, get your mental health steering in the right direction. There are a number of reasons for this, but before I get into those reasons, let me just emphasize what the protocol is. The protocol is get outdoors, ideally with no sunglasses if you can do that safely, even if there's cloud cover. More photons, light information, are coming through that cloud cover than would be coming from a very bright indoor bulb. So getting outdoors is absolutely key. How long should you do this? It's going to depend on the brightness of the environment. It's going to depend on a number of different factors. Two minutes would be a minimum. 10 minutes would be even better. And if you can, 30 minutes would be fantastic. Now, if it's a very bright day or, you know, you live in a place where there's bright sunlight, clear day on a snowfield, you would only need something like 60 seconds. But most people aren't living in those sorts of conditions. So getting outside for a 10-minute walk or a 15-minute walk will basically ensure that you're getting adequate stimulation of these neurons in the eye that are called the melanopsin intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells. I know that's a mouthful. These are neurons that don't care about shapes of objects or the motion of objects. These are neurons that convey to the brain that it's daytime and it's time to be alert. And it sets in motion a huge number of biological cascades within every cell and organ of your body, from your liver to your gut, to your heart, to your brain. It really sets things down the right path. Early in the day, we experience a natural and healthy bump in a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol comes from the amygdala. That cortisol, as I mentioned, is healthy and normal and promotes wakefulness. It actually promotes a healthy immune system. So I know you've heard that stress and cortisol disrupt the immune system, but not the short little pulse of cortisol that you get each morning. It's very important that that pulse of cortisol 
arrive early in the day. I want to emphasize this again. It's very important that that pulse of cortisol arrive early in the day. And that pulse of cortisol is going to happen once every 24 hours, no matter what. It's going to happen and you get to time it. How do you time it? Primarily by when you view bright sunlight or bright light of another kind. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So you want that cortisol pushed early. If you wake up before the sun comes out, it's fine to turn on artificial lights, but then you would want to get outside as soon as you can to get this, art, this excuse me, natural light stimulation of your eyes. And it does have to be to your eyes. Just to really drill down into the details for a moment, you don't want to stare directly at the sun or any light that's so bright that it feels painful. If, it's, if you feel like you have to close your eyes or blink, please do. You don't want to damage your retinas. The point here is to get the sunlight indirectly. It's going to essentially be scattered everywhere through the cloud cover. But you know from looking at a, at a flashlight directly into that flashlight versus looking at the beam that flashlight generates on the ground that if you're standing in the shade, you're going to get less of that sunlight than you are if you're out in an open field. So this is why the time outside, it's going to need to vary depending on your particular environment. But do your best to do this every day. If you miss a day, no big deal, but try not to miss more than one day. Otherwise, your mental and physical health will start to suffer. And doing this each day costs nothing. It's just time. You can combine it with the forward ambulation, with the walk and the optic flow that I talked about before. And that's what I do each morning to generate a sense of alertness in my body and brain to generate a sense of calm yet alert. And that's also what I do with Costello, with my bulldog. People have asked me, do these same mechanisms apply to animals? Well, the reality is many of these mechanisms were actually discovered in animals and then were tested in humans and verified that they also exist in humans. Not always. Sometimes it was the reverse where they were tested first in humans and then brought to Now we have a first protocol, which is to write down the time of day that you wake up. The second protocol is to get take a walk first thing in the morning. And the third protocol is woven in with that walk, at least for me which is to get that sunlight exposure screens. So then Costello and I get back from our walk. Sometimes that walk was 10 minutes. Sometimes it was 60 minutes, depending on how slowly Costello is walking that day. Indeed, many mornings, I'm the guy carrying his bulldog back up the hill. My neighbors know me so well. They know Costello so well that they've since stopped pulling over and asking if the dog is okay. Sometimes they'll ask if I'm okay. Nonetheless, we get back. I give him his food. I give him his water and I give me my water. I'm a big believer based on quality peer reviewed data that hydration is essential for mental performance. Now I confess, I don't really like drinking big glasses or big jugs of water first thing in the morning. I don't know why, but my thirst doesn't tend to kick in first thing. You may be different. Either way, I force myself essentially to drink at least 16 and most days 32 ounces of water. I also put a little bit of sea salt in the water. As many of you know, neurons require ionic flow. What that means is neurons need sodium, they need magnesium, and they need potassium in order to function. We do tend to get dehydrated at night. Even if the day is not very hot, I try and top off or I try and make sure that I'm hydrated early in the day before I begin any work. So I make myself drink this water with a little bit of... At that point, I start thinking about and fantasizing about and craving caffeine, but I don't drink that caffeine yet. I purposely delay my caffeine intake to 90 minutes to 120 minutes after I wake up. Of course, I know when I wake up because I wrote it down, although it's pretty easy to commit to memory. The reason I delay caffeine is because one of the factors that induces a sense of sleepiness is the buildup of adenosine or as some people call it adenosine in our system. The buildup of adenosine accumulates the longer we are awake. So when I wake up in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, your adenosine levels are likely to be very low. However, caffeine is an adenosine blocker. It's actually a competitive antagonist for you aficionados. It sort of parks in the receptor that adenosine normally would park at and prevents adenosine from acting on that receptor. That's why you feel more alert because it's essentially blocking the effect of this sleepiness factor that we all create called adenosine. 
The reason for delaying caffeine intake 90 minutes to two hours after waking is I want to make sure that I don't have a late afternoon or even early afternoon crash from caffeine. One of the best ways to ensure a caffeine crash is to drink a bunch of caffeine, block all those adenosine receptors, and then by early or late afternoon, when that caffeine starts to wear off and gets dislodged from the receptors, a lower level of adenosine is able to create a greater level of sleepiness. It took me years to figure this out. I used to wake up and I'd think, oh, I don't want to drink caffeine too close to bedtime, so I'm going to start drinking my caffeine really early. I let my cortisol naturally come up in the morning. I avoid drinking caffeine until about 90 minutes or two hours after waking. And when I do that, I find that I don't experience the afternoon crash. My primary objective early in the day is to get into a mode of being focused yet alert so that I can get work done. I found that the best way for me to achieve that state is through fasting. So I don't eat anything until about 11 a.m. or 12 noon. Fasting increases levels of adrenaline, also called epinephrine in the brain and body. And when our levels of epinephrine and adrenaline are increased, we learn better, we can focus better. There's terrific data supporting that. You don't want epinephrine, aka adrenaline, too high. That feels like stress and panic. You get jittery, you can't focus, but in its optimal range, adrenaline really provides a heightened sense of focus and the ability to encode, meaning bring in and retain, remember.